Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. We are here with my boy, my homie, one of tennis parents that I respect uh, and have grown to know over a couple of years and root for from afar. Uh, and I'm always a phone call away because, you know, sometimes we all need a shoulder to cry on or somebody to vent to um, because it takes a village to kind of make this happen. So I'm here with the one and only Michael Parks, Michael Parks, uh, father of Alicia Parks. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. So you was a basketball player, right? And so I, I look at a long list of basketball players now that got their kids playing tennis. You got Keon Dooling's daughter playing tennis. I know Deion Sanders' daughter's playing tennis. All these great former athletes. Bob McAdoo, right? Great former athletes whose daughters, one way or another, found their way into tennis. Uh, so I'm curious as to with your athletic pedigree, with the size and the strength of your daughters, they probably could have played anything. How did you decide to get them in tennis? Well, when it started off, we, you know, they played everything, basketball, scrim. They was good at pretty much any sport. Um, we played softball, and I'm always into my kids' life, no matter what they've done when it came to sports. But we were from the old school, North Carolina, and, of course, my wife from Georgia. So what we ended up doing, it was like, okay, you get to go outside and play. So that's where it started at. If it's not too hot, you stay outside. And um, we, I was out one day, and I'm going to just tell you, well, well, we started them off in church league with basketball. We started them off with softball. So that's where a lot of the hand-eye coordination came from. Um, coming up from North Carolina, I was into basketball heavy. I always wanted my kids to do what they wanted to do and supported them of whatever sport they wanted. But when it came to the girls, when it came to tennis, my wife, they made uh, all A's, A's and B's. And so my wife took them to the toy store. And Alicia, of course, it'd take her forever to find out what she wanted. (laughs) You know, so when she made good grades, my wife went there bought tennis rackets. She's a paralegal at the time. And um, she wanted to read some books. So she took them to the tennis court and she called me. She said, Mike, you got to see her play tennis. I said, these kids can't play tennis. And uh, so when I went out there, they rallied 150 balls back and forth. And I was amazed. But what it started, Coach, it started off because they was, we spent a lot of time with them, with basketball, with um, softball, and all of that. So I think that's where that hand-eye coordination came from. Mm. You know, that's where it started. And um, and then we went from there. So it wasn't like one of these stories where you're watching Venus and Serena. You're aware that tennis is probably the highest revenue generating sport for women. It was just they stumbled upon it because they ended up going to the toy store. Exactly. Wow. And so at that point, did you go on the, on the journey of trying to read books and watch videos on how to teach them yourself, or did you start taking them to formal training all right away? Well, I, I, I started off, this is this is the, the honest to God truth. Um, I try to get them the expertise from different coaches, and I, I ran into a lot of problems with, I guess the business sense came out, and I, I saw where there's a lot of revenue from the coaches and uh, in tennis. That's just my opinion on it. And I didn't feel comfortable with it. So I started reading, like you said, I started looking up certain things with Venus and Serena and trying to learn the technique and things on my own um, to get them involved, get them the best training, the best technique I could get. And and you're right. I started reading at that time, me and my wife. So when we did that, you know, being an athlete out of North Carolina, it was kind of easy because there it's all about technique. Do you didn't play basketball? So that was the first thing that came to mind with that. And then we went from there. So you grew up. So at the time we all living in Florida, North Carolina, because one of the things that I think is a big impediment to someone starting out in the game is court time. So living in Florida or a warm weather state gives you an advantage early because you can kind of mess around 
you know, play with your sibling, get the hand eye, get a feel for the court before you really invest. But when you live in a cold weather climate, you got to buy that court time. You know, the lessons is not just the lesson. Now it's the lesson and the court you got to pay for. So it's hard to sort of give it a try. So where were y'all living at the time to have that luxury of trying to figure it out? Uh, we was living in Georgia. And um, at the time, they started in like June, July, when they first picked up a racket. And of course, you know, in Georgia, it get cold there in the wintertime. So <laughs> it's amazing because we was out in trench coaching, coats at the time. And it's amazing when, when you say that, I and, and, and I saw the, the progress of the girls. I saw the progress of the girls when they um when they was doing the with the tennis and the Haywood that played for the Braves, he was out there also when it was cold. You know, mm -hmm. he was out there too doing a lot of the the training. And like I said, me and my wife out there in trench coat. So we we stayed in Georgia probably about eight months to a year afterwards. And then we end up moving down to Florida uh, with the USTA. Um, they, Patrick McEnroe asked us to come down, Martin Blackman. And uh, so we went from there. Mm -hmm. And then we started, you know, in the, in the warm weather because it was kind of tough in the cold climate. Now, let me say this. So you got identity. Okay, so you, you moved down to Florida. At what point did you put them in tournaments? Because we see a lot of parents, um, when they when they take the Venus and Serena route, they hold them out of tournaments, right, to sort of mold them and train them so they don't get uh, sort of entrenched in some of the negative things that, that you know, it's, it's a lot of good that comes from junior tennis. is also a lot of bad, right? So we've seen tennis dads hold them out. And we've also seen tennis dads throw them in there to learn how to compete. What was your approach? My approach, Alicia started growing, and Michaela, you know, she's 5'4", but Alicia started growing and uh, just going up. But I held them out of tournaments because of the, the development, and I let them compete in swimming, basketball, different other sports to get that competition in and just try to work on a lot of the technical aspects of the game. And um, thanks to Rick Macy, that he helped me with that to show me a lot of the technique. And I, I have to give Rick a lot of credit because, you know, as well as I know, tennis is expensive, very expensive. And Rick took me up under his wing and showed me at the, you know, at the end of the day, Mike, work on this, do this technique that way. And it's a lot of prayers. I used to wake up at night sitting in the same living room and um, asking God, what do I need to do? And at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm up going over technique and thinking of things before I started working with the girls. But I got to give a lot of uh, props to Rick with that. But we we really competed in other sports, you know, just to get that competition. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and with that competition, because and then I, I held them out because, to be honest with you, and I'm just going to tell you the truth on it, a lot of the junior tournaments, it wasn't in our favor. And I, I'll tell you like it is, there was a lot of cheating going on, a lot of other stuff going on. I like to have water thrown on me, of course. And I'm going to talk about this, too, if you don't mind. But I got mm -hmm. suspended when people were treating me bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so now when you say treating you bad, what happened? Because, you know, we, you know, I always say, man, it's the parents in tennis, they become so invested that it, it can get a little crazy, right? And it can get a little aggressive and you know i'd be like it's the kids out there competing not us so what was your experience like early on especially you know as african americans in the sport back in the day yes. right it, now i think uh, you know blacks are kind of carrying the sport you look at coco venus if you look at the last four u.s open champions they've all been african americans been venus serena sloan and uh coco now right so yeah. i think blacks now have quite elevated the sport and even in the junior circuit, there's more of them. But back when you were coming up, it wasn't that many. So you think it was more racial or you think it was just more parents just being just overly kind of competitive? Well, I, I experienced uh, both. I think because okay. I have people telling me that, uh, you know, I, and this is true. You guys got basketball. You got this. We don't want you to take over that. Uh, and I'm like, wow. Okay, that, and then also with the um, 
with the racial and then even with the parents uh invested like you said with their kid i don't think they really understood what sports was all about um by me coming up with basketball at a high level i understood this and the parents go over the top when it comes to tennis because they want to live through their kid and what people don't understand is when you play professional sports the percentage is low anyway so it's not guaranteed that you're going to be a professional athlete but I think they get so caught up in it that they act certain ways. And uh, that's my take on it. So when it came to the suspensions or different things that I had to go through, I, I mean, I was like, wow, because everybody on the circuit and, and pretty much in juniors, I love kids. I work with kids. And the perception they had on me was, oh, he this and he that. No, I just didn't understand it of how people would act that way. And um we went through a lot. We went through a lot. So, so we went through a lot. And um, I don't know. I don't know when it comes to, you know, the, the, the racism. I know that's there. And um, I'm glad that we're doing so much for the Black community and the Black athletes. I'm so proud of Coco. I'm so proud, of course, you know, I look up to Venus and Serena and, and different ones, and as well as Zena Garrison. Oh, mm -hmm. I love my Zena Garris, mm -hmm. one of my dear friends, and 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 with with all of that said, I knew we could do it. That's who motivated me to do it, and my thing was to give the kids the opportunity to, to reach their goals. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I I think that um, it, it does help to have sort of professional athlete pedigree to help mold another a, a, another athlete even in a totally different sport. So tell us a little bit about your professional background in sports. Um, well, I played basketball. I led the nation in, in high school. And then um, I kind of, one reason I knew, well, well, I'll get into that later on, but I played in the um, GBL league and uh, in Atlanta. And the thing about it is I went through a lot back in the day with the same thing. So I knew how to kind of handle that situation with, the racism or the, how should I say it, the challenges through sports. Mm -hmm. So that's what helped me with Alicia and Michaela to deal with the things that we deal, we dealt with. Now, mm -hmm. with I'm glad I went through what I went through. They always say, the Bible always say you want to do, you want your kids to be better than who you are. And so that's one thing that molded me to know how to lead them up to where we are now. So. Now, let me ask you this, because, you know, obviously I'm a coach. I got three kids and, you know, they're not, you know, they're six and eight, and you know what I mean, 18. But they're they they they're not in it, like, to a level where it's uh, contentious, right? Yeah. But how did you handle being coach and dad, right? Because I remember some of those long car rides home with my father. And either getting the silent treatment or getting your butt chewed out the whole ride home, right? And then yeah. it carries over to the dinner table. How did what was what did, from your perspective? I'm sure we ask Alicia and she got a whole nother perspective. Uh, yes. But what was your perspective on how you handled the transition from an afternoon practice to the car ride home to the dinner table? And then from a potentially bad loss to the dinner table. Um, it it was you know, the hardest part was is trying to get her to understand. I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't it was that bad early on. And, <laughs> and what happened was because I, I my my thing was to, to help them reach their goals. So I wasn't that parent to, like, push them and all because I look at sports as, some, you know, that's your game. My game was basketball. So as a good father and my wife as a good mother, we never really pushed them that that way. What we done was we try to get them to understand and love the game. That was the biggest thing that we try to do to respect the game, love the game, and do what they could do with it. So when we did the ride home, it wasn't really that it wasn't really that bad. And to, to hear the voice because I coached them and and done, it was fun. What I try to get out of it, I was spending a lot of time with my kids. Because there wasn't money with it. You know what I'm saying? I was spending time with my kid. And of course, when they get older, 
that's when the problems come in because everybody get in their ear. Everybody want to be part of them. Everybody want to, they want, they want to get on the bandwagon now from what, what you do, the things that you've done. They, where were they at when you was trying to get up there? Mm-hmm. Because you know, mm-hmm. financially it was tough and all you wanted the kids to do is really to take advantage and and take it take advantage and appreciate what you have for them and the time you gave them. Because this is an expensive sport, especially mm-hmm. if you don't have anybody supporting you the mm-hmm. way we've done it. Mm-hmm. We came up and done the things we done with my wife emptying her, her 401k, um me with inheritance that I had and and the people that had our back. So we done it a little different than everybody else. And that's one reason I thank God for it. And, and that's what you're always going to hear because I might be wrong, but I don't think it's going to get done this way again, the way we done it. Mm-hmm. We didn't have a lot of wild cards. We didn't have a lot of things to get up in the, the nationals. We didn't, we done it the way we done it. And we got to give thanks to Alicia and, and, for doing what she done. I mean, you know, uh, get out there to, uh, to compete. So now let me ask you this. Cause you know, I say, you know, there are, there are some parents that produce one tennis player as you produce two, right? Yes. Um, you know, you got John McEnroe, Patrick McEnroe, uh, James Blake, Jason Blake, you know, you got Venus. You said it. So what is always interesting is the siblings, right? Because one sibling always goes a little bit further than the other. Right. Yes. How was how did that work between Alicia and Michaela, and when did they start? When did the levels start to sort of uh, separate? Well, they started separating when did you? It, 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 Alicia kind of went up because of her size and different things uh, with her, the way she compete. Michaela always competed, um, but I think right at probably around 15. And the one thing that I love about my baby, Michaela, uh, well, she the oldest, of course, Michaela, 24 years old. But what I love about Michaela, everybody give a lot of praise to Alicia because that's all they can see her now. Right. But I give a lot of praise to uh, Michaela. Michaela came up to me and she said, Dad, you know, I think Alicia got more upside. You know, Alicia's six feet, six one. Michaela, five, four. I, I, she amazes me, Michaela, because first of all, she gave up tennis to coach and go to school and everything. She was like, it's tough on you. I think that's the best thing in my life that ever happened when she said that, not for her career, but it was just the fact of my baby, the way she looked out for me and my wife, you know, financially. She said, you Mm -hmm. can't go over here. You can't, it's tough. You know, you don't have really the support that you needed. So you get behind Alicia and you do that. I mean, you know, you know how that must feel to a father Mm -hmm. for your child Mm -hmm. to say that. And then in about 15 and all, and and like Michaela, she's ready to graduate with a business degree. She owned businesses and, and everything. And so it worked out great. And that's, that's where she made it easy on me. But it was around 15 years old, 16 years old. But, you know, also, there's a, you know, you think about there would be no Serena without Venus, right? Because you, there's a lot of benefit to Alicia having somebody in the house to hit with. You know yeah. what I mean? Versus having to search for a hidden partner and then the schedule doesn't work out. I mean, your your time on court gets cut by 70% if you got to seek out hidden partners versus having somebody at home with you. So. I think, you know, being the younger sibling, even if you're slightly better, just having somebody to hit the ball back and forth with you, I mean, really it, just helps. Oh, it means the world because you think about it, the way we was, um, the way the girls were taught, they got one-on-one lessons and my wife, my wife know more about tennis than I do because she was there. Um, the one thing about and one reason I said it would never probably never be done this way again is because the way we came up and we done it, Michaela means the world to Alicia. My wife means the world to Alicia because we didn't hit have hidden partners. You see what I'm saying? And most academies have hidden partners, as you know, a different people come through to hit. But 
Michael, Alicia had Michaela to hit with. And then she had Erica to hit with. Erica got on the wall and learned how to hit the ball. I remember <laughs> Erica said, um, I'm going to go out here and play. I said, you go to the wall and hit and learn how to play. <laughs> so they hit the ball. Then she got pretty good at it. Technique was a little off, but she mm -hmm. knew how to mix up the ball. So Erica was just as important, her and Michaela, to Alicia. That was Alicia's biggest, um, I think, the biggest thing for Alicia to become a professional because you had a, a Michaela could hit fast, Erica switch it up, and we got out there and they were, sometimes we played three against one with Alicia. So mm -hmm. that was a big part of it. And Michaela, like you said, Michaela was our hitting partner all the way through. So we have to give Michaela a lot of credit. And you said it, you know, with a sibling, it means the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, Alicia homeschooled, right? And, yeah. you know, I get asked by parents all the time, you know, oh, my kid is 80 in the country, should we homeschool, right? Or you know, my kids now playing ITF, so they're 80 in the country and they can't play ITF if they don't homeschool. At what point did you decide to homeschool Alicia? And what advice would you give to the parent that's considering it, right? There's got to be, there really is, I mean, I always answer the question with, it depends, right? Because there is no clear cut answer on when to pull your kid out. But when did you do it and what advice would you give to another parent? Well, the thing about it, um, I think you should wait and let them get to that level to see their potential. Uh, we started homeschooling Alicia, I think, in the third grade, and Michaela was in the fourth when we moved down here to Florida. And uh, we had help with one of the young ladies from Atlanta, Miss Nadine. Um, she told us a lot about the homeschooling. And, and I kind of like that because the school systems, I've done a lot of volunteering with the school system when I was in Georgia and in the community. And I, I felt like the education level was going down. It wasn't just that we homeschooled them because of tenants. It was because of the, the education level. It started switching and going over. So we done that. But when it comes to tennis, I think everybody should to see where the kids' potential is at before they start homeschooling. Because when you homeschool, remember, I had two. So they can kind of relate and they can kind of um, interact with each other. And then I spent a lot of time with Alicia and Michaela, like the banks and teaching them other things. And you don't just homeschool a kid just for school because they'd be lost. And I see that with a lot of kids when it comes to communicating and uh, with the, with the tennis, cause you know, tennis, it's a different world. So I think that's the problem with a lot of players right now or, or the kids that play tennis. They they don't get the communication skills that they need. That's my opinion on homeschooling, unless you're going to spend a lot of time with them other than the, the education and just loving them and spending so much other time with them. So I think it's, it's, it's where the kid's ability at. Now, if they're doing it for, for tennis, wait until you see where they're at. And to be honest with you, I knew Alicia and Michaela was going to be good at whatever they done because it's in their blood. My mm -hmm. whole family is athletes, mm -hmm. and that was easy for me to know. And then I knew what my wife, the education we had, and then how my wife was a paralegal and all. I knew she was going to, you know, school them right. I knew they was going to have education because it's in my family. And I knew, you know, so it was easy for me. Now, when it comes to sports, I think what a lot of people got to do is don't put the tennis before the education. If you notice now, Kamal, now, to me, there's so many players coming out of college right now. And I spoke to one of the sponsors uh, the other day, and we was talking about that. Now, the potential and most of the kids that's coming out as college players. Used to, it wasn't that. And I love that about that. Go to school, get the education, and mm -hmm. then see what you end up doing, unless you got someone and I and I am gonna say this. I am gonna say this. Um, maybe I'm I'm going too far ahead, but I love Rodney Harmon. Mm -hmm. Rodney Harmon spent time with us. And you know, when I got ready, when it came to college, and let me let me say this, because this is really on my heart. You know, in, in tennis, you find a lot of people that they look out for themselves. 
Rodney Harmon told me, if Alicia is 400 in the world, of course, he saw things that I didn't, you know, because we just, we were getting into tennis. He said, Mike, he was recruiting Alicia. About every school in the country were recruiting Alicia. And Rodney Harmon told me, he said, Mike, if she's 400 in the world at this time, send her straight pro. And I had, for him to say that, because you know as well as I do, a lot of coaches are selfish. And the first thing they, they look out for themselves to get the top player to stay at a job and to win. And I really admire that man so much. I love him to death because the, what he told me, and look at what happened. Alicia is 40 in the world in singles, um, 27 in doubles, I guess. So, I mean, I just really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So I was, that was even one of my questions. At what point you decided uh, – not to go to college. You know what I mean? Like some people say, hey, okay, you win a junior slam or Nike cut you a big check. Then you, you know, or, you know, you top 10 in the world, uh, ITF, right? And yeah. then for sure, you don't, you know, you don't go to college. So I was going to ask that. So it sounds like Rodney was one of the people that advised you uh, not to go. So let me ask you this. Um, when did it get hard, right? Because I know we look at, you know, when I look at all these players, no matter if they're Black, white, American, Croatian, Russian, Belarusian, Tunisian. I look at them and I and I don't see, oh, man, this is so great. This is just a young lady living out her dream. I can look at them in the whole setup and I say, I wonder when it get hard, when it got hard. And I wonder how they made it through. Every player, Ons, I mean, everybody, your strengths, all these, they, there's a uh, Rabakina, you know what I mean? Like going to play for Kazakhstan. Because you can get some support. There's always a point where it gets hard. It's never as like glamorous or easy as it sees when you hold a trophy. Well, for us, it was hard from day one, financially. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, but we made it do what it do. Uh -huh. so we did a lot of prayer, and, 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 and God had us. I mean, anytime time we, we went on trips, tournaments, and um, – we didn't even know how we were going to get to the next one, but we had faith. We would just go. We never got stranded anywhere. Um, we had one of my business partners, one of my friends, Phil Gray, uh, from McDonald's. I got to put him in there. I mean, this man didn't really know us from anywhere, but he believed in us. And he said, Mike, everything that you said, you accomplished it. I mean, I had people that, to me, that should have stood up to have our back, and they didn't. I mean, it was hard from the start, but we had Phil Gray. Um, of course, my wife. My wife, I got to give her a lot of credit because, you know, they sometimes I was out there and it wasn't never I doubted the talent. It was just, is it worth it? And that's just the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and then I had, I got to go back to Rodney Harmon. Back when the girls were young, he gave us lessons. And he know we didn't have the money to do that at the time and show me what to do. And I learned from him. I got to give props to Nick Bollettieri. Like when we went over there sometimes, um, he would do lessons here and there. And he told me, he said, Mike, when the girls are outside, I'm playing, you stay right in here learning. I learned, and that's how I learned how to teach them what to do. Thanks to all these young men, these men and, and the rest of so Nick, um, but Rick Mason. I got to give credit where it's due. I mm. have to. And, and yes, I was there, trained my kids and my wife, like I said. But if it wasn't for these young men, these men to teach me what to do, because I play basketball. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was hard the whole time. And I just think it could have been a whole lot easier with the support. But like I said, I, there's a lot of people that didn't step up. Mm -hmm. And that's just the truth. Yeah. I think. You know, those those individuals you mentioned, I think, you know, when you see uh, a dad with young kids, right, who have talent, as a coach, you say, okay, these kids can play. They're not going to be able to pay for every hour that they need on the court. They need to be on the court 10 to 15 hours a week. Nobody can, very, well, let me say very few can afford to pay for all 15. So let me let the dad stand right here on my hip. 
show, you know, listen to what I'm saying, emulate what I'm saying, and take this one hour and go turn it into four or five hours on their own. You know, and that's that's really the way it should work as a coach is the parents, even when you take the parents, have to have some level of understanding when they take them to the tournament. You know, I'm not taking a kid to some level four in Indianapolis, right? So the parent got to be able to come back and give some feedback and and know what they're talking about. So I always agree. I, I think it's good that coaches of all calibers, right, educate yeah. the parent. You see, I see a lot in junior tennis now where it's our parent, go sit up on that balcony and be quiet. Let the coach do the work. You know what I mean? And I just don't believe, I believe one of the reasons why we have so few pros compared to other nations is because most American kids have to pay for every hour on the court. There's not a lot of, you know, situations where if you're a member of the club, you get free walk on court time. You get a free ball machine. If Eric can come stand right here, use this basketball and hit with you as long as the court is open. You know, those situations have to exist if there's going to be another Alicia and McKay, right? So yeah. it sounds like that's what the situation that kind of helped out. And that was a big hit. I mean, yeah. you, you would hear me say, and everybody, you know, they talk about the dad, you know, talk about me, talk about my family. And 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 I thank everybody for that. And they realized that, but they had to be, I had to start or learn from somewhere. And and you're gonna hear me always talk about on interviews and different things that we got uh we got a story coming out, we got a, a documentary coming out, of course. But the, the biggest thing about it, you're gonna always hear me talk about the Rodney Harmon. And I gotta talk about the Scott Beard. Scott Beard from Atlanta. I remember the girls went there before we moved down here and they said I told him, go ask him. And they saw him coaching and playing, and they asked him, can you coach us? This man stepped up and coached them for nothing. And then when we got down here to Florida, and I just reached out to Scott the other day, and um, he's reaching back out to Alicia to come back in the picture. But the Rodney Harmons at the time, the Rick Macy, Nick Bolletieri, um, there's a lot of people that stepped up to give us court time or, or uh, help us or help me understand how to train them. And I really appreciate that. I give them all the props in the world because if it wasn't for them, they wouldn't be no us. Mm-hmm. And and with that said, now financially, that's a whole nother story that they were people that wasn't there. I just mm-hmm. leave it at that. Mm-hmm. If you so know right that. now, if you look at Alicia, And now she's, what, 22? Yes. 22, grown woman now, top 50, uh, has a singles title, right? Has a doubles title, um, and now is an adult. How is it now parenting an adult, right, and trying to help them transition into the real world, right, Uh Uh, growing up? on a global stage with everybody looking at you. And, you know, you didn't have social media back in your era. I didn't have it in my era, right? And so they got a lot more, people have a lot more access to them, positively and negatively, right? I mean, that's you can, you can, somebody can send Alicia a negative message on her phone. I guarantee she see it on Instagram, right? They can't resist not looking at it, right? So how is it now trying to sort of let her grow up and have a career and still be a parent? It's, it's tough because we're going through that now and uh, we just do, you have to do a lot of praying. And me and my wife discuss that all the time. It's like the social media, and I tell people all the time, it's a great thing. Social media is great. Um, you know as well as I know, we own a network and, I, and, and we're doing a positive network because there's so much negativity out there. And the, and the thing about it is when it comes to Alicia right now there's a lot of people in her ear it's and i'm glad you brought that up it's because the kids now don't know what to listen to they're going to read this me and Corey, coco's dad we talk about it all the time and i tell him and i say don't worry about the media because everybody trying to boost these people up trying to do this to say what you need what you don't need and to be honest with you come on i want to know how many people done what we done you see what I'm saying? But everybody got their opinion on things. And even when it comes to Alicia, 
okay, Alicia, I used to stay close to her. I remember Nick said, Mike, you always going to stay close to Alicia. You won't let nobody get in there. You know why? Because we're, ta- we're kind of going through that now. And what it does, it hurts the kid. It's slow their progress now because of the social media and people are in their ear. You know, me and you, we always talk about this. We talk about this so much. Um, social media is great, but it's bad too. You know, and, and if the kids don't understand how to use it, it can hurt them. It can slow their progress down. So mm-hmm. that's, and that's a good question. And I hope people really understand that to try to stay close to the kid, to keep them, shelter them from certain things, because they're going to read it. They're going to read the negative stuff. People out there on the road, I have so many people to come in. I can do this. I can do that. Well, okay, well, why didn't you do it? Now you want to come and play. But where were you at back then when mm. we needed you, when we was coming up? So, yeah, that's where social media is at. So, um, uh, always, you know, it's, it's interesting when you watch the kids grow up and you watch their years, right? How their year progresses. They're having a good year, bad year, start off having a bad year. And then the parent shows up always. So, so I sit back and I can see, you'll see five or six tournaments where Benchich dad is not there. And then seventh tournament, daddy's out there, right? You know what I mean? So at what point do you pop out, right? Cause you know, you got to let the kid be out there figure out their own, make their own disorder, you know, choices, surround themselves with who they think can help them at the time. Um, but it is interesting to see when, the, you know, we saw the U.S. Open, Corey and I sitting in the box, per se, sitting up in the suite, right? So it's yeah. interesting. When, when, as a parent, when do you pop out just <laughs> to sort of let your presence fail? <laughs> your well, you, know, you know, usually when you pop out, when you're the parent, it's because you see that they need you. And they they come back. They're always going to come back. You know, at some point they come back because they always think the grass greener somewhere else. And so what happens is when somebody else destroy or tear up something, they come back to where it's at. You know, because the people can say what they want. Uh, coach Corey Goff, that's my coach. But, if, you know, and I'll say it like that. Everybody else want to take credit. Candy, that's my coach. You know, for Coco. And it's it's amazing that you say, you know, say that I have to pop out. We always, the parents always going to be there for you because that's a different type of love. And then if they coach the kid, they know the kid pretty much better than anybody else. But the problem is you have to clean up some stuff people mess up. (laughs) (laughs) And and that's the truth. So that's when you see me pop back out. Because I don't get caught up in the limelight when it comes to that, you know, when it comes to tennis or anything like that. And that's one thing I want Alicia to know about us. We're going to love you regardless. I mean, everybody know who I am. Everybody know that I taught Alicia and, and things like that and my wife. But at the same time, we don't get caught up in that limelight stuff. We love you. We're your, your parents. We, mm. we, we're not in there for the fame. We just want to see you do good. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I know. It's, it's always fun. I used to say, I think uh, when I first started coaching, I think Sybil came to like the first three tournaments and then she disappeared. I'm like, well, where you go? She said, you got it. <laughs> it's a, and then three or four tournaments last night, I said, I need you to come. You know what I mean? Because sometimes you just need somebody to have a drink with. You know what I mean? So I always, I'm always cognizant of, cognizant of, you know, players that have their team or travel in the world and every now and then. You can see, okay, daddy popped out, you know what I mean, to kind of yeah. get things in line and make sure everything stays tight. So that's why, that's where the question comes from um, because it does take a parent to make a pro. No coach can make a pro, right? Yeah. It takes a parent. It does. Make- and, you know, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to put you on blast right now because I'm mad at you. Ah. <laughs> why are you mad at me? Why you haven't called us and uh, I'm finna send Alicia up there where you at, okay? <laughs> Alicia can come, man. Let me tell you. You know, I don't. I don't hit no more. I just stand there pointing, yell. So we, we always need people to hit with somebody to change the energy up, right? You know what I mean? Because you, you know, you get stale being with the same person six, seven weeks. So anytime, brother, my door. And I gave it a wild card a couple of years ago. Anytime, my door is mm-hmm. wide open. So you know, 
But again, I'm the kind of guy where everybody got the phone number. When you need me, call me. But I never, you know, because I'm sure you know, every, out of 64 people, 63 going to lose. Absolutely. And when you lose, your phone start ringing. You need to be doing this. She need to be doing that. I mean, literally. You know what I mean? I could see the parent's phone beside me blowing up as soon as the last point is over. And I always said I would never be that guy that watched the match from home, didn't see what happened in the warm-up, don't know what happened the night before, right? Don't know what happened in the practice court, but have something to say after the match. So I never insert myself, but I'm always, boom, I need you. Yeah. I'm always there for you. And it's funny, and, and you know I know that. And I, and I say that, and uh, you know, we always been to the point where, and I and I tell Zena all the time. I said, Kamal, she talks, she thinks the world of me, and I and I tell her I can't wait to get her over there. You know, we we what happened? The route that we took, it took us a minute to get up here because we didn't have that other help. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So a lot of people see us now, and we're just really catching up we're catching up financially of what she's doing and and i thank god for that but so we were a little behind the eight ball with that that situation now we're there so now we can go different places because early on we couldn't do certain things and it takes money to run things that you do and i've never been that type that like to stick a kid on someone for nothing and now we're at that place that at this level, it's time for her to, to, to explore a little bit, go places and see who can touch this and that. I've never been the one that wanted to just be a hands-on with Alicia. Honestly, I really didn't want to coach Alicia, but I saw how it was out there because you run across some coaches that it's all about the dollar bill. And that's just the truth. It's all about the dollar bill. And I can see that coming from North Carolina being an athlete. And I can see right through it. That's what I would tell uh, parents to understand the coach, the coach that care, the coach that's going to benefit your kid instead of just making money. And mm -hmm. I, I read through a whole lot of that. And all these coaches that I met, I mentioned in this, and even with, you know, with you and all, I think the world of, I mean, the greatest coaches, I thank God that I was a part of, some of these coaches that I mentioned, I mean, uh, Nick Bolletieri, uh Rick Macy, um, Scott Beard, you, um, Rodney Harmon. I mean, come on, that's that's some of the greats. And 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 God will provide you everything that you need if you if you pray, you put you put Him first. I guarantee you, He will line people up for you. To, to reach where you're at. But if you try to think you've done it yourself, you're in trouble, especially with this game. 100%. And, you know, one of the things I always, I was uh, I was around Haley a couple of days ago when she beat Pliskova. I walked right by and said, hey, great match. And I sat right next to Costum and said, yo, how you doing? You know, because I know as the parent, you know, it take a lot. No one really concerned about you and what it took to get you here and how you staying out here. So I'm one of the ones when I look at you, or I look at Corey, I look at Cosmo, I look at Sheila. You know, I'm always like, how you doing? Because you're the one that got to, that ultimately is responsible, right? If the kid don't make it, they're not going to blame a coach. They're going to blame the parent. All right? right. So that's why I always check in. Like, hey, how you doing? How you, how's, yeah. how's everything good? Anything you need? And then, and then I just let you spill it on out, right? And then it talk you off the ledge. Well, you know, you know, so, Coach, I got to say this because I'm glad you broke up Sheila. Sheila Townsend, that's my heart. Mm -hmm. Sheila pitched the first ball, fed the first ball to Michaela and Alicia in Atlanta. Mm. And she didn't even remember. You know what I'm saying? Because mm. she did it from her heart. But I remember she said, you got something special here. That's what made me and Erica stay behind the girls, Sheila Townsend. Mm. And and I talked to Sheila not long ago, and we, we feed off of each other. I love her to death. And she was a big influence on our lives for us to stay with tennis. And because, you know, when you when you don't know about a certain sport and when you when you're talking to people 
and that been in it and the kids and the coach, you learn from them and it lets you know, it feeds you fuel to say, hey, um, maybe I'm, I need to keep doing this. You see what I'm saying? And when she told me that, but Sheila Townsend was the first person that fed the girls balls in Atlanta. And uh, she's another one that got two players. She got a Taylor and she got Simone. Absolutely. And, they don't, and, and people, they see Taylor, Simone was great. Mm hmm. Simone oh, was great. Simone was a good and 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 everybody look at Taylor. That was a big plus for Taylor. Simone. You gotta mm -hmm. give Simone credit. And mm -hmm. and it's good when you got siblings like that, they don't get enough credit for where that one that you see the uh the one that's playing professional. It came from that sibling, mm -hmm. that pushing. And as you well, you know, you look at Venus and Serena. So I'm glad you, you know, a lot of this, this topic, people need to know these things. And, um, and I, I give credit. I get on my phone and I call a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I call a lot of people to thank them the way we came up. And I, and I got to say this, uh, Alicia played, with her, played her last night. And um, that, that young lady right there, I call them all my babies because they babies to me. Mm -hmm. But they're they are adults because I work with kids, but they're adults. But on what make it worth my while when I be out there on tour and these kids, these young ladies come up to me and they say to me, I have to put this in. And they come up to me. Hey, Mr. Parks. Hey, dad. I will run for them. Yes, it's called competing. That's not I'm an adult. I love to see these kids. These young ladies do what they do and be successful. It's a blessing to play professional sports. Mm -hmm. Come on, come on. You know, Coach, you know the percentage to play professional sports is very low. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing. But what make it worth my while through these years, me and Erica, is that how they react to us, all the players on tour. They speak Sakari, the same thing. She see, she nod her head, she smile. And that's what I want to be known for. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that. Well, man, let me just tell you, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Uh, everybody knows who you are, but probably has not heard, had a chance to hear you speak and hear the story. So, um, you know, man, you know, I look up to you. I admire what you did with your, with your kids as a dad. Um, I respect what you've done as a, as a father more than anything. Uh, and I understand where you're at, what you're doing and how you're pushing one of the best athletes in the world to go forward. So, man, I want to congratulate you. Always rooting for you. My phone is always up at midnight, 1 a.m. It don't matter. I roll over. I get to, the phone be ringing. Right? So anytime you need me, I'm always there, bro. I appreciate you. But well, this has been a Tennis.com podcast with the father of Alicia Parks, Michael Parks. Thanks for listening.